When I was searching around for a lunchtime speaker, I, I checked with a few people, and Len Nichols' name kept, kept, coming, kept, kept coming up. So I finally got all these recommendations, checked with Uwe, and he says, oh, yeah, he's wonderful, go get him. You know, so we'll see, right? <laughs> <laughs> now, that wasn't that wasn't appropriate at all. So but Len is a uh, highly respected healthcare economist, and he directs the health policy program at the New America Foundation in Washington. And it aims to expand health insurance coverage to all Americans, while reining in cost and improving the efficiency of the overall health system. And before joining the New America Foundation, Dr. Nichols was the vice president of the Center for Studying Health System Change, the principal research associate at the Urban Institute, and the senior advisor for health policy at the Office of Management and Budget during the Clinton reform efforts of 1993 and 1994. And being an ex-budget person, I had an interesting discussion with Len on the phone. So. He has testified frequently before Congress, state legislators, and has published widely in a wide variety of health and related journals. Previously, Dr. Nichols was chair of the economics department at Wellesley College, where he taught for 10 years. He served as a member of the Competitive Pricing Advisory Commission and the 201 Technical Review Panel for the Medicare Trustees Report. And bringing it home here locally, he was an advisory on the advisory panel to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's Covering America Project and has been a consultant to the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank and the Pan American Health Organization. Dr. Nichols, we're pleased to have you here. Well, thanks, Rich, and thanks, Uva, for uh, uh, getting my name passed on here. I, I think it's, a, it's unambiguously a privilege and an honor to be here. I, I feel like, in fact, I'm, I'm humbled at the prospect of trying to compete with that reputation. I feel like I'm standing in Uva's pulpit, so I will try to be uh, true to his God as, as we go forward. Let me say just a word about New America because it's probably not a household name, although we're trying hard to become one. We are uh, about a 10-year-old 501c3 nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy research institute think tank in Washington, D.C. But uh, probably our uh, unique uh, claim to fame is that we were created by a couple of smart people and a couple of rich people who figured out Washington was having a very hard time having bipartisan conversations. And our raison d'etre is to create space for bipartisan conversations because we're pretty sure that we're not going to solve our largest problems, and certainly the health system issues uh, rank in that order. We're not going to solve our largest problems with one vote majorities. We have to work in uh, a way that can achieve bipartisan success. So that's kind of our, our day job. Sometimes I describe uh, what we do as pushing a square boulder up a hill. You probably know that in Washington you can make a very fine living and earn uh, a great reputation, have a long distinguished career, pretending to believe things that are not true. <laughs> and you can also make a very fine living, have a long distinguished career, demanding things that cannot be. And my happy job is to piss them both off every day, but to keep them talking to each other. Because it is in talking to each other that we have hope. And hope, of course, is what we need to hang on to. It is true I'm a health economist, and most days I'm proud of that, although Uva is right, we aren't quite human beings. But nevertheless, uh, some days I'm proud of that. But people who know me well, as Uva and may do, know that I really am a preacher who was kidnapped on the way to seminary and forced to go to economics graduate school. And it turns out economics is a good place to go for a would-be seminarian because you see there's a God to worship, efficiency, there's a liturgy to give you comfort in times of confusion and stress, contain optimization mathematics and econometrics. And there's even an apocrypha, Marx, to seduce the young and piss off the professors. Now, I promise, as we agreed, I'm not going to preach too long, and we will not take up a collection. But I do want you to feel free to say amen from time to time if the Spirit moves you. It's all right. You are allowed. You know, one of the great things about having Huckabee run for president is the whole country now understands amen. It's a good thing to, to see that. 
Well, um, basically what I want to talk about today is why are we having this conversation? Why did we not talk about it in 2004? Why did we not talk about it in 2000? I encourage you just for fun, go back and look at Al Gore's proposal from 2000. And you will see he was going to spend $9 and cover five more people. It was truly an ambitious plan. And you ask yourself this question, why are we talking about this now? A little bit, and you heard some of it already quite eloquently, uh, about competing visions. I'll put it in a little bit more stark terms, perhaps. And then what I think the upcoming debates will be about. I'm really here because I live in Washington, so I am something of a Washington creature. I'm not real proud of that, but I feel compelled to stay for two more years to solve our problems. And I'll talk a little bit about the political economy of the discussion going on and then some scenarios as we, as we move forward. I think there are two big reasons we're having this conversation as a country. And one is pretty simple. It costs too damn much. If you look at health insurance premiums as a fraction of median family income, and these numbers are meant to be respectable, that is to say they count at its total premium, it counts the employer contribution as well as the employee contribution, because in the long run, we all agree, it comes out of wages. Maybe not in the short run, we'll talk about that, but in the long run, it comes out of wages. So what you see is in 1987, a family policy claimed 7% of median family income. Of course, you know since you're at Princeton, that's the middle of the income distribution. Today, it's 17. And that's just another way of putting, perhaps in more human terms, the rate of growth of health care costs exceeds the rate of growth of average productivity in our economy at such a rate and for so long that it's becoming increasingly unaffordable for a larger and larger fraction of our population. Now, I submit to you that is why we're having this conversation. Fear of affordability has reached the middle class. You go back and look at 92, and I encourage you to do that too. Look at the run up to 92, and you may start in 91. You remember, it's the economy stupid. You remember a crazy Cajun named James Carville who was advising a fuzzy-headed professor or running against a sitting attorney general who was up 20 points in Pennsylvania, Harris Wofford, right, running against Dick Thornburg. And Carville came up with this ad which caught fire. And the ad was, if every criminal has a right to a lawyer, why doesn't every American have a right to a doctor? And that catapulted Wofford to the lead of Thornburg, who was taken aback by such a phenomenon, and put the issue front and center on the American uh, electorate. Clinton, you may remember, did not really have a health plan early on. Songus had the health plan. Uh, I don't know, maybe Zika uh, de designed it, I'm not sure. But Songus was re raring to go, ready from day one. And Clinton stole it, of course, and won the election. But nevertheless, um, the point of this is, in 91-92, Fear of affordability, what drove all that, was a recession. It was very deep, and uncharacteristically, it was coinciding with a restructuring of mid-management in the Rust Belt. So you had a lot of white-collar people losing their jobs. That's what drove Daddy Bush from office. That's the economy, stupid. Fear of affordability was driven by the recession. As soon as the economy recovered, and you may know, it began recovering in December of 92. Clinton didn't have all that much to do with that. And the recovery, of course, coincided with an exact mirror image decline in support for universal coverage. You can see it in the monthly polling. It's quite distressing. But the point is this. Back then, the fear of affordability was driven by the recession. Today, it's driven by this graph. You look at what the candidates do in real life. A couple of years before they run, they go out and do focus groups, polling, and all that stuff. And they came back with this. And they said, oh, my God. Middle America is worried about paying for health care. We can make health care a big issue again. In fact, we should, because if we don't, they'll think we're not paying attention to what they care about. The second big reason, and this is a little more complicated, but not to, not to non-economists who are, who are actually human, um, international competition. You know, there was life before NAFTA. It was a lot simpler in some ways. You go back maybe 30 years, maybe 40 years, and what you see is an American economy that was so dominant in so many sectors that costs could just be shifted forward into prices because we were effectively oligopolists for the world. Right? Well, guess what? That's not possible anymore. So what's been going on is health care costs have been bothering employers. And this is a simple chart. There'll be an exam at 1.30. You could have your brownie if you get the answer right. 
But the point of this is to compare dollar cost per hour for health care paid by employers nominally, and we'll talk about that in a minute, paid by employers nominally, United States versus our trading partners, manufacturing sectors. The numbers by the countries in the first column are where they rank as our trading partner. And the point of this is basically the right-hand column. We spend $2.38 per hour on health care in our manufacturing, and our trade weighted average is 96 cents. Now, I am not going to claim that 238 comes out of the employer, but I will claim in the short run which is, after all, where CEOs live. Economists live in the long run. That's where our models work, right? We understand long-run equilibrium. And in long-run equilibrium, I have no doubt, it comes out of wages eventually. But in the short run, my gentle friends, if you've got double-digit inflation year after year after year in premiums, you can't push it backward into wages completely immediately. You can't push it forward into prices anymore because we're no longer oligopolists to the world. We're now competing against a lot of countries who have far more efficient systems. China and India make low value added jobs here unsustainable. What's dangerous to our economy is we're losing the high value added competition, which is what this graph is about. We're losing the high value added competition to countries that have full fledged social systems. They have solidarity and other things. And they're spending way less on health care than we are. And they rely less on employers to finance it. So my point is simply this. The reason you see, and a lot of what you don't see, is employers coming to Washington, proverbially and literally, grabbing the lapels of the politicians and saying, you've got to quit this kabuki dance and solve this problem, or our jobs are going overseas. Or actually, your jobs are going overseas. And we're going to be left with Walmart and Starbucks which are fine places to start and end your careers. They're not great places to sustain a middle-class economy. Noted here first, it is not written in the Constitution or the Bible that America will be a middle-class society. We have to nurture our comparative advantage, and we are squandering it by not paying attention to what health care costs are doing to that comparative advantage over time. This is a very simple way to convey what health care costs look like to the average business, because it simply contrasts ESI is the rate of growth of health care costs, again, nominally paid by employers, the check written by them, versus GDP growth, which is a proxy for revenue. It actually understates the disparity because this includes GDP growth revenue for all companies that don't offer, which we know is a larger fraction of business every year. But the point is still the same. No matter what the business cycle, no matter where we are in terms of the economy over time, Health care cost growth exceeds revenue growth. When health care cost growth exceeds revenue growth, only three things can happen. All of them are bad if you're the manager. One, you can cut wages and piss off your workers. Two, you can cut profits and get fired. Three, you can reduce investment and lose profits in the future and get fired then. None of those options are good. And all those options force trade-offs and force some kind of reevaluation of where we are. And that's why you're seeing more support for this. The third reason, not quite as powerful as the first two, but nevertheless becoming more important as we get in a more serious conversation uh, and toward actual legislation, is that there's far more awareness of linkages among problems. You know, Zeke spoke quite well about our natural historical preference for uh, incrementalism. And it's because, as Churchill said, you know, you can always count on the Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. <laughs> we don't really want to try that hard thing because it's hard. And I get that it's hard, trust me. I have scar tissue and gray beard and lack of hair on top to prove it. It is hard. But we are becoming more aware of the failure of incrementalism, which is why we see many more linkages being drawn. And I would say the two most important are we're figuring out that not paying attention to quality costs us money. And we know, as Zeke said, cost costs us coverage. And second, we know a lot more about the consequences of being uninsured. You know, back in 92, I was on the Clinton uh, team. I'm not ashamed of having tried to bring universal coverage to our country. I'm not proud of every line in that 1,500-page bill. But we tried. We failed. We learned a lot. We're back again. We're going to try again. <laughs> But the point is, back then, we basically just had a bunch of stories about the consequences of being uninsured. And stories matter, and they work. And in fact, we need to tell them even more eloquently than we did then. 
But we didn't really have what I would call the powerful systemic evidence that can persuade opinion elites. Well, I think we're coming closer to that now because the Institute of Medicine in its wisdom convened a learned panel of the sages like it does from time to time. And they came up with an uncharacteristic outcome. You know, typically they meet for years and write long reports and have lots of appendices and nice footnotes and typically say there's not enough evidence to reach a conclusion. So when they do reach a conclusion, it actually gets news, makes news. And this time, a few years ago, they reached a the conclusion that 18,000 Americans die every year for lack of timely access to care, which they would have had had they had normal health insurance. So I'm talking about routine care, extreme Cadillac coverage. I'm talking about stuff we all take for granted. And why is that? Mostly because they don't go until it's too late. There are a lot of great institutions in this nation who will try to treat people with certain percentages. Um, and once you're inside and upstairs, you get the same care. But lots of times it's too late. You know, my grandmother had a slay in rural Arkansas. No blood showing, no bone showing, no blood flowing, no bone showing, we ain't going. That was pretty much the way we, we behaved. And that was because she grew up in the Depression and so forth. Well, you know what, if you're uninsured, they pretty much operate by that rule. So when they show up with stage three breast cancer, there's not much you can do really, but give them painkillers and manage it going down. So what we learned is that 18,000 Americans die every year. We didn't know that before. Now you do the math. We stopped debating health reform as a nation in 1994. Uh, you know, this is Princeton, you can do this. 14 years multiplied by 18,000 people. Not quite a trillion, but it's a big number. A quarter of a million people. If I had told you in 1994 that we're not going to take this up again until a quarter of a mil million Americans die, I think we might have kept talking. We have a more profound understanding of the cost. And the Institute of Medicine went on to move it beyond the moral dimension and also talk about the economic dimension. You know, all those people who die, a lot of them were workers. We have premature death. We have prolonged morbidity. The economic cost of the uninsured is credibly estimated to be about the same as what it would cost to cover all Americans. It's not just a moral question, although it is. It is also a question of stewardship. It is also a question of smart economic policy. It's the right thing to do. It's a smart thing to do. We know all this now. And finally, the system stresses are appearing more and more, again, to the middle class who actually vote and respond to polls and focus groups. About half of our nation's cities, uh, hospitals, are on diversion uh, a lot of the time. Uh, and Houston is 35% uh, every day. Um, people are noticing. They have to wait a long time to get any kind of appointment. People notice the system stress. People are more and more aware of the cost shifting, more and more aware of the hidden cost of the uninsured. We do pay for them in backdoor Byzantine ways at the moment, and it does get shifted to us in lots of ways. And more perhaps precisely in terms of the Washington debate, thank God for Peter Orzag. He's, he's the best CBO director we've had in quite some time, and, and Orzag is explaining quite carefully and is now convinced the majority of both parties that, in fact, our entitlement, quote, problem is really a health care cost growth problem. And the solution to that problem has got to include health care delivery reform. And therefore, the fiscal stress is seen as another reason to take this on. So that's why we're talking about this. Now, it is America, so we do have competing visions. And I will simply say, as usual, there are roughly three. Uh, Zeke had four. I'll say three. Uh, and, and we can talk about sort of uh, how the two might meld. But they are, naturally, quite starkly different. The first, I'll simply characterize as markets are perfect. And the basic perception here is that the biggest problem is that we over-subsidize group insurance because, they say, the biggest problem is, of course, we have too much insurance. Now, I've got to tell you, you've got to be really, really smart to look at a nation with 46 million uninsured people and probably another 50 million underinsured and conclude that the biggest problem is we have too much insurance. You have to be really smart to convince yourself of this. I'm personally not this smart, but nevertheless they have. And they of course see two ways to solve the problem. One is absolute tax neutrality. The first and foremost policy tool 
is to make it tax neutral about where you buy your health insurance. So you abolish the employer preference and encourage people to go to the individual market. And the second, of course, is the, the fundamental flaw, of course, if markets are perfect, is that we've not allowed perfect markets to come into existence. So the solution is deregulation. The solution is to completely deregulate and have laissez-faire. You know, each human for herself. The alternative, and the polar opposite, of course, is that markets are hopeless and cruel. And that basically says that, of course, the problem is not taxes or anything like that. It's all about capitalism. What they really hate, of course, is capitalism. But they really, really hate capitalism and health care. And what they want to do is, of course, have government buy it with taxpayer money. And that they would focus on population health management. Let me just say some of my best friends are single payer people. And it, I, in fact, as a technical matter, this could work. As a political matter, I don't see how we get from here to there. You know, I have the privilege of speaking about this stuff all over the country. I'm not sure why people like the accent or something. But I would just tell you, between Philadelphia and San Francisco, we are not going to vote for single payer. It is not going to go. Now, maybe there's something to do with, you know, in the middle of the country, they don't trust the government. On the coast, they do. Maybe that's because on the coast, you can see the water, and you know you can get away if the government gets really intrusive, really fast. <laughs> I don't know. But I will tell you, between Philadelphia and San Francisco, it ain't happening. So forget that. And then I would say there is what I call practical idealism, or what you might say is markets are powerful but flawed, and they can be fixed. And it is the idealism that says they can be fixed, but you know, that's why I wake up in the morning. The biggest problem from that perspective is the ideological blinders each side has adopted. Therefore, the solution is, in fact, the same solution as what's politically feasible, maybe, and that is bipartisan reform. Now, what does bipartisan reform mean? Bipartisan reform means that both parties have to see their core values reflected in the policy outcome. They have to be able to sell it to their constituencies. For Democrats, of course, that means you've got to cover everybody and you have to take particular care of the vulnerable, the low income and the truly sick. For Republicans, it means you can't have bureaucrats and government dictating. You've got to have markets and real choice, real incentives play an important role allocating resources. And you have to have a budget constraint. We are not going to write a blank check for any of this. We didn't in 94. We didn't in 72. We didn't in 45. We didn't in 33. We're not going to do that. So, what does that really mean? It means you're going to have to make a new marketplace that works for everybody. And we can talk about how you might do that, and some of the plans that are going to be uh, elucidated will do that, in my view. But Zeke is absolutely right. You have to couple this with serious delivery system reform. You cannot just do coverage, not to uh, cause too much uh, consternation, but that would be lipstick on a pig, to just put coverage out there and, and claim you solve the problem. You've got to do delivery system stuff. And delivery system means, in my view, information infrastructure. I'll talk about a little bit more about what I mean by that, but it's more than electronic records. It includes decision support, new incentives, and comparative effectiveness, just like Maggie laid out. We have to do all this stuff. And then I would say, obviously, you have to do subsidies, and you've got to have a real budget constraint. Okay. Here's the good news, in my view, looking at it from a political economist perspective. Take a step back from the current tit-for-tat final stage of the campaign and go back to January when they were all still in the race. And just think about the entire Democratic field's proposals. In my opinion, compared to 92, 88, and so forth, there's been progress. Why? Because Kucinich was the only Democrat to propose single payer. All the rest of them, Edwards, Clinton, Dodd, Richardson, Biden, remember, he ran too. All of them had private insurance market competition at the core of their reform. Democrats have discovered markets. Come on, sports fans, let's admit that. That's progress. We are making progress here. At the same time, <laughs> at the same time, and I agree, this doesn't get a lot of attention because let's remember, it's hard to talk about health care. It's complicated. The media hate it, right? So they just want to focus on the one question in the one press conference or the one debate, and they want to talk about coverage. But you go to the websites and you look 
And you will see a great deal more attention devoted to delivery system reform than ever before. And I would submit, look at the way Senator Clinton unveiled her plan. She started with cost. Second was quality. Months later came coverage. That was all meant to be a signal. And the signal was Democrats have discovered we've got to do delivery system too. The good news is Republicans acknowledge a lot of Americans can't afford this anymore. Again, compared to where they were, this is progress. You've got to applaud progress. Come on, be fair. And I would say, if you look at McCain, and now we have to, you look at McCain, and what you see is a guy who has transparency. He's talking about pay for performance. He's talking about, God forbid, payment reform inside Medicare. You might remember this. The American Medical Association doesn't like any of that. He's the first Republican in my lifetime to say the supply side has to be reformed too. This is progress. The boy is still a maverick on health care. And then I would say, the other good news that came out of the campaign, Huckabee. I did love his preaching, but let me tell you. If you saw him give his health care speech, if he were standing here today, what he would say is, if we were having this meeting 40 years ago, half of you would be smoking and the other half wouldn't care. And he'd be right. And his point is, we can change the way we think about our own responsibility for our own health. We can change the way we take responsibility for our own health. And more importantly, if we don't take more responsibility for our own health, it doesn't matter what the economists come up with on financing. We're not going to bend that cost curve. We are not going to make this thing affordable going forward. And finally, I would say the catalyst was Romney. In many, many ways, you're going to, we have a whole panel devoted to that this afternoon, but I think it's fair to say the contribution that gentleman made to our discourse on this topic is there you had a Republican presidential aspirant willing to use the word all. This is progress. This is progress. <laughs> and you had a Democratic legislature, with the exception of California, the most liberal body on the planet, willing to accept the word limit. That is an appropriations bill, not an entitlement. Republican, all Democrat limit. We can work with this. We can work with this. We can work with this. OK, meanwhile, back in Washington. Massachusetts got noted. Illinois got noted, too. Illinois had a blue ribbon commission appointed by the governor and the legislature. You may know Barack Obama sponsored the legislation when he was a state senator. And they came up with a nice little hybrid plan comprehensive and the governor kind of screwed it up. Then you had uh, politics, but he tried, to t he tried to put all the financing burden on business. Not smart. Colorado had the same kind of commission, same kind of activity. They're still in, in the phase of deciding what to do. California, you may know famously, crashed and burned. But I think it's fair to say, just take a moment and let's all be thankful for Arnold too, because look what Arnold did. Arnold said, damn it, I wanted to be first when Romney went. And then Arnold said, you know what, I'm going to try anyway, even though he had over twice as many uninsured as a proportion of his population, even though he had no uncompensated care pool that already covered 85% of what the uninsured spent, already set up in a tax structure that had been agreed to. Arnold, can't, you can't get taxes in California no matter what you do. And third, and let's be blunt and frank here, you can put all the undocumented aliens in Massachusetts in my car. So <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a long way to Mexico, and it's cold up there. So you know, um, in California, you may know, the governor proposed covering undocumented children. When asked the question in private, he said, I'm an immigrant. And he told a story. And he said, we can't not do this. They weren't here. They didn't come here on their own. We can't not do this. The Democrats in California oppose covering illegal children. It's a big problem. So Arnold, in my view, took on a phenomenal task. And what Arnold did, among other things, I mean, you know, Arnold's, you know, he's kind of short, it turns out. But like, I'm a 44 regular, Arnold's an 84 regular. He's really, he's got a good size, and he is hard to admit. So you notice Arnold, and what Arnold did was get Washington's attention, trust me. 
Because Washington said, oh my God. Now Massachusetts, that's one thing. They're a bunch of crazy lefties up there. But California? Arnold? If they're going to try with their problem to solve this problem, we cannot sit around and act like it can't be done. And therefore it was catalytic. And catalytic to the point where you started having tectonic plates move. Now, better health care together, which is the first one and the most interesting. You remember that's when Lee Scott of Walmart and Andy Stern of SEIU agreed to shake hands in public in Washington and say, Lee Scott said, we got to work together to reform our health care system. Now think about this. There you have two men that spend approximately a million dollars a day attacking each other. Their constituents, by the way, were not in favor of this handshake. And they shocked the world. I wish I had had Mitch McConnell's EKG when Lee Scott said, and we have to have more government to make this work. Andy Stern's partner in drama, SEIU president, said, and by the way, we can't just tax business to solve this problem. We've got to talk about some kind of shared responsibility. So there you have Lee Scott saying government, Annie Stern saying don't tax business. I'm telling you, if you can do Walmart and SEIU, next year we can do Jerusalem. This is possible. It is absolutely <laughs> possible. It is possible. The next little thing I will mention is this Pay attention to the trade associations, not too deep attention, but pay some attention. Let me call your attention to the first one, Federation of American Hospitals. Federation of American Hospitals is the for-profit hospital association now run by a man who's become a friend of mine and Uva's too, May's too, Chip Kahn. How many of you know what Chip Kahn did in 1993? Two pros, no. You ever heard of Harry and Louise? Chip Kahn invented the concept. What we need is a family sitting around the kitchen table showing how the Clinton plan is all a bunch of crazy socialist bureaucrats. Well, Chip Kahn puts out a plan about a year ago, a year and a half ago, right after Arnold, right after Better Health Care Together and all this stuff. And it basically says new marketplace, work for everybody, got to have new insurance market rules, got to have subsidies for the low income, all the things we're going to talk about. And here's what Chip Kahn was doing, friends, in the criminology of Washington. He was sending a shot across the bow to his Republican colleagues saying, guess what, guys? We can't just say no this time. We have to think hard about this. We have to figure out a way to make this not partisan so we can claim victory and get this off the table or they're going to use it against us for a very long time which is where this legislative development about which I um, am somewhat excited comes in. Ron Wyden of Oregon, fairly liberal guy, one of the, I don't know, top five or six liberal voting records in the country, came to me and probably Zeke and, and countless others, and you know, every December the ambitious ones call in the eggheads and they say things like, you know, uh, you're in the idea business, I'd like some new ideas, and here's what I'd like, I'd like to, you know, cover ten people and spend twenty dollars, and can you make that nice in a nice little bow, and, and so we do this in December because that's what think tanks do, and this time, in December of 05, Wyden says to me, I want to write a serious bill, I perked up, said, define serious. He said, I want to cover all Americans. I want to bend the cost curve. I sat straight up and said, how can I help? He said, here's the deal. The polling is showing we're going to take the House. We might take the Senate. Who knows? We're going to take the House. And I want a Democratic bill in January of 07 that covers all Americans, bends that cost curve, that is not single payer to show the world that Democrats understand markets. And your job, Lynn, is to make it market friendly enough to attract Republican support. Well, you know why once was a health economist, so I can do that. And a bunch of others helped too, let me tell you. And you know, Lord knows he did some things on his own, but I'll just say, and it ain't perfect, but in arguably the most polarized Congress in our, well, since John Adams, right? And, 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 and in an election year, we have 16 co-sponsors, eight Republican, eight Democrat. Bob Bennett from Utah ain't no liberal. Judd Gregg from New Hampshire is the most fiscally conservative hawk budget guy in the caucus. Lamar Alexander's in the leadership. Chuck Grassley's ranking center finance. Now, these gentlemen did not suddenly have a great warming of the heart for the uninsured. 
although I do know they personally care. They are doing various forms of calculus, including chip cons. We can't just say no this time. We have to find a way to make this something that we can claim is indeed a bipartisan solution. And it turns out, as you may know, we need 60 votes. Okay. Um, common things to expect as we go forward. We cannot afford it. You'll hear that no matter what it is. And you, you know it's because we can't afford it. It's because we sort of squandered a fair number of our resources. It's because, dare I say it, Uva, we don't tax ourselves enough. We might admit that, we might not. You're going to hear, do what you want, but leave me alone. That is, in fact, what the lobbyists are now doing as we speak. The last two months, we've passed the Kumbaya phase. People have stopped being nice down there. People are laying out their markers. Well, you can do all you, but don't touch my thing. Right? And that's kind of where we are and where we'll be for a while. You're going to hear a lot about individualism. You're going to hear a lot about, you know what, shared responsibility is the American way, too. Individualism made this country great. I commend to you David Brooks's column in the New York Times this morning. He talks about how the Republican Party is trapped in the extreme individualism of Goldwater. And it's got to move beyond that. I submit amen. Individualism will always be the core of the American self-image and the core of what made us great. And we have to pursue that. But we have to remember, go back and watch those John Wayne movies from which we learned this stuff. There was always a posse helping the man. There was always a school marm making him, and a, and a preacher. And a, there was always a community. There was always a community, and a community, as Uva says, what is the definition of a nation? A community is one that takes membership in it seriously and extends membership to all its relevant citizens and makes it possible for each individual to reach their own potential. In the absence of that community, we're not going to get there. And you're going to hear a lot about that. You're going to hear a lot more because the employers are ready to sing this song. The cost of doing nothing is high. Go back to the Institute of Medicine. You're going to hear, oh gosh, you're all right, all this is true, Lynn, but the political systems just can't handle it. You know, we don't have John Adams anymore. You know, my favorite part of the David McCullough biography is when John is in Philadelphia working on the Declaration, and he's standing there writing, or sitting there writing a letter to Abigail, of course, where we learn everything that really matters. And the letter to Abigail is while he's watching Jefferson, Franklin, Madison, Washington, you know, Monroe. And he's writing to Abigail and he says, you know, I just don't think we're going to be able to pull this off. We don't have enough talent in the room. <laughs> and, and then I think about today and I go, oh my God. <laughs> but you know what? It's not that we lack talent and we know that. Conditions and times produce the talent we need when we need it. Where'd Lincoln come from? Jesus Christ, we can do this. Okay. Political agreement, in my opinion, while it's going to be hard, political agreement requires, as Zeke said, credible delivery system reform. We are not going to write a blank check on coverage. We're going to have to do this. And the key word here is going to be trust but verify. My favorite phrase from Ronald Reagan and the only one I'll ever quote. Trust but verify. We are going to find out how we're doing. We're going to do what Maggie says. We're going to find out how we're doing, and we're going to figure out what to do about it. Okay. Uh, I probably better speed up because I want to be able to take some questions, but we've sort of been through this. Delivery system reform is the key. Capturing savings is hard, and Uva taught me this a long time ago. One person's cost is another person's income. That is the single biggest constraint between here and the promised land. So the solution, of course, is to do what? Bribe them for the transition. You, you sort of set up a way to let them make money on the transition. It's going to take time, but this is not a debatable proposition. We cannot survive as a middle class culture unless we figure out how to solve this problem, and therefore we will. Okay, biggest problem, of course, is incentive misalignment. I'll just say if you combine fee for service for providers, low cost sharing for patients, a very small and undisseminated uh, evidence base, you're going to get what we got too much low-value care. So we're going to have to figure out how to fix that. The technology approval is the biggest thing because fundamentally technology is probably what drives healthcare cost growth over time. And it's not technology necessarily bad. It's technology that adds value, but maybe for a very small number of people, and we grossly overuse it. 
You know, why should you have an MRI if an X-ray would do? And what we've got to do is figure out a way to incentivize the clinician and the patient to make the right choices. And I don't think it's rocket science, but I do think it's going to take some work. Here's the good news. A lot of myths are being challenged. Think about this. This is the AMA mantra ever since it got uh, power. All providers are equal. It turns out that's not true. And we know it better now. We also have believed for a long time higher prices imply higher quality. Turns out that ain't true either. Turns out more is not better. Turns out while medicine will always be an art, there's a hell of a lot more science to it than we are now applying. And that's really what this evidence-based medicine movement is all about. Promising examples, medical home has become a metaphor for payment reform and therefore it means what people want it to mean. But it's also true, it's, it's headed in the right direction and there are some good examples of evidence which we'll talk about if you'd like. I would say the more promising example in the long run though is not just setting up primary care docs to fight with hospitals over the money we'd like back. We need to have shared savings models across sites of care and that way you get buy-in. What, one thing we learned in Clinton times was you're not going to reform the healthcare system turning stakeholder groups into monolithic opponents. You're not going to reform the healthcare system if all docs hate you. We're not going to reform the healthcare system if all hospitals are fearful, drug companies, etc. You've got to divide and conquer, obviously, but you've got to figure out a way to show the better ones how they can make money out of this. And if you do, you can. Okay. Uh, what is the vision? Well, I've talked about electronic infrastructure. Incentive realignment, that includes malpractice reform. And it, by the way, in my view, it includes both payment reform for providers as well as cost sharing reform. There's no reason not to have evidence-based cost sharing. But the key is some kind of comparative effectiveness. That is to say, some kind of infrastructure whereby we disseminate, produce, and create a culture of finding the best practice for the specific subpopulation and so forth as you go forward. And I would submit to you, if we do all this, there's no reason to think we, cannot, we, we can't pay for some of the cost of coverage expansion. Consider the following facts. One third of what we spend now, I think Maggie said it, is not adding clinical value. We spend 16% of GDP. That's 5% of GDP we are wasting. Reasonable calculations are it would cost 1% of GDP to cover all Americans. What if we could get 10% of the low value care out for each of the next 10 years? At the end of that 10 year horizon, we would have $900 billion. We could then reallocate to cover the uninsured, improve our education system, pay for infrastructure, maybe buy a gun or two. My point is the opportunity cost is huge if we would just get our arms around it. Who will win? In my view, in the system, those who win are those who can earn and maintain patients' trust. And that's going to require you both to produce value and verify, trust but verify, your contribution in a way that sophisticated buyers understand it and in a way that patients understand it. It will always be a two-tier communication if you're going to win. And what we hope to do and what, in my view, public policy is about is setting the rules. As Uva said, you cannot have a market without rules. Setting the rules so that those who will win are those who are better at science than they are at marketing. Right now we have the opposite. And the good news is some drug companies get that. And by the way, a lot of docs get it and hospitals get it and you're going to find, I think, more and more of those guys coming forward. Those patients, agents, the ones we hire to help us make these decisions. And that's going to be the big competition. It could be a health plan. It could be a primary care doc. It could be a nurse practitioner. It could be your mom. It could be lots of different people. But they're going to be competing to be our agents. And it seems to me those agents are the key to the competition. And at some level, the vision on display in the campaign is who's going to be your agent. In the McCain vision, of course, it is yourself. It is the individual, and it goes back to that Goldwater conservatism and that absolute libertarian view of civilization. It does emphasize the individual market. To McCain's personal credit, it seems to me, and certainly his advisor, Doug Holtzikin, is a fine American and a smart guy, and he gets it. You know, let's be frank, McCain can't spell healthcare, doesn't matter. He's focused on other things. He has good people around him. If he wins, we can work with him, I'm quite confident. Holtzikin knows what the hell he's doing. Holtzikin got him to go to 
significant Medicare reform, and that's where we'll focus. If you look at the Democratic, Obama's just one of many, if you look at the Democratic vision, it all has to do with HIT, health and information technology, comparative effectiveness, and so forth, emphasizing group purchasing, group versus individual, agent being collective versus not, and that's the big debate. If McCain wins, here's a prediction, then I'll stop. If McCain wins, there will be no coattails. Congress will be Democratic. There will be 54 to 57, depending on the day. They will not be in a good mood. And so they're not going to just roll over. They're going to try to embarrass him by forcing him to veto a comprehensive bill. It would probably be less realistic than it would be if a Democrat was in, in so it could be kind of ugly. Uh, McCain's campaign plan is not going anywhere because this Congress is not going to adopt libertarian individualism. It's not going to happen. What you will get, however, I believe, is S-chip. McCain voted against it before because he had to. He was running the Republican primary. You've got to forgive him for that because, after all, South Carolina is not France. Okay. But McCain will sign a S-chip. You heard it here first because it will be a perfect, brilliant, maverick stroke. And it lets the D's get that basic human need taken care of with relatively little money. The Senate version, let us not forget, had 17 Republican co-sponsors before. So it would be an easy thing to do, and it would allow him to say, look, I'm not Bush, and get that out of the way. Then we'll get down to, if McCain wins, I believe, serious discussion about using Medicare to get some of the delivery system stuff in place. If Obama wins, I don't have inside information on this, but I certainly believe, for lots of outside observations, the deal Kennedy cut was, I will endorse you if you m promise me health care is a high priority and I carry your water. What guy wouldn't take that deal? So he did. Kennedy's illness, as you all know, in addition to the personal tragedy, which is real, is that he is, in my view, the last lion who can tame the liberals when you need to. And trust me, we will need to. So his departure, if it should come about, is a huge loss to the cause. That means people are already, including him, thinking about who can take the baton and try to make this happen at some level in his name. That will be a very important set of choices. That also means, trust me, history has been read. The Obama team will not send up a 1,453-page bill. The committees will write it this time, as they should have last time. You might have heard this rumor. The House is different from the Senate. It is far more liberal, far more cantankerous, far more pissed off, and still angry over the way S-chip played out. In that, think about this, they passed their version. The Senate passed a more moderate version that they knew could get 60 votes. In fact, got 68 veto proof in the Senate. And Nancy Pelosi made those barons in the House take the Senate version in one day. They have not forgotten that. There's going to be some discussion about that sort of thing. But at the end of the day, life will come back to the Senate. Thank God. <laughs> and the Senate. Uh, you still require 60 votes, which is why you need bipartisan to make this happen. Um, this is the landscape at the moment, and I would say the following. Conyers is, uh, first line, free health care for all. That would be the pure vision. It has 83 co-sponsors. It will not be voted out of committee. Stark is Medicare as is for all. That will be a starting point. It's a, Fine starting point. Frankly, I hope it passes. We need Stark because you need to scare the hell out of people that you might have price controls coming. It's a very useful fear. Kennedy Dingle. Kennedy at the moment and Dingle are choose either Medicare or FEHPP, but choose something. Obama's there in the middle. Then you got Wyden Bennett, which is basically Zeke with a little more political feasibility thrown in. <laughs> and then you got McCain and, of course, Coburn over there on the far right. And so I would say if Obama wins, the debate will be, can you bring the left close enough to Wyden Bennett to get 60 votes? If McCain wins, the debate will be, can you get enough Republicans to break from him 
to actually send him a bill, he might actually sign. You could have a Nixon China moment here. It is indeed imaginable, but surely not in the first term. Okay, most likely we'll renew S. Chip and sing Kumbaya. We will fail. It'll be a nice song, three verses. Uh, fail to agree on details, and we'll settle for plan B. And my hope is plan B will be, okay, we're going to start this delivery system stuff, we're going to cover kids, and we're going to cover all Americans in 2015. And we walk toward it with commissions chaired by UVA to try to walk us in that direction toward the promised land. Here's why health reform is hard. You start down here with policy analysts. That's where I live, you know, the wonks. We come up with all these grand schemes. We teach the advocates. The advocates can get all excited, indeed, even orgasmic, and they scare the hell out of the stakeholders, <laughs> right? And the stakeholders go, oh, my God, I can't have that, and they make Harry and Louise ads and scare the citizens. And then we're back to go back into your cave, you silly policy analyst. Now, here's what's different. The stakeholders are scared now. They're scared not so much about the money they're making today. They're scared about how they're going to maintain what they're doing in the future. And it's not just the empty pipeline and drug companies. It's the hospitals looking at how we're going to make this, this Byzantine system continue. The doctors looking at what the hell is going on. What you've got now is a potential for stakeholders to come around. So what do we have to do? Remember, the cost of doing nothing is high and rising. Remember Isaiah, you know, Uva and I have an agreement. We each mention religion in every talk we give. So here's Isaiah. You may know this, you may not. Isaiah, you know, it's a book in the Bible. He was a prophet. The historians tell us he really existed. He really was a human being. He really was a member of the Jerusalem elite. He lived in the time when the kingdoms were divided and the Assyrians were coming. Isaiah was smart enough to see the Assyrians are coming. And Isaiah knew that the divided kingdom would have a hard time defending itself if it didn't unite. So Isaiah basically was worried about two things. One, of course, the physical survival of the land of Judah, the physical survival of the Jewish people. But he was also worried about the covenant. He was also worried about how are we going to maintain our vision of community if we don't live up to the promise we have made to each other. The practical implication of that was, hey, you know, these poor guys aren't going to fight for us when the Assyrians come if they're starving. And thus, there's a lot of stuff in Isaiah about speaking out for the oppressed, for the widow, the orphan, the stranger, the language from Leviticus. And the point is simply this, if you think about it, physical survival, and what good is physical survival if you don't live up to the covenant of God? Those are the same two questions, in my mind, Israel faces today. They're the same two questions the United States faces today. Think about those people we have sent to Iraq and Afghanistan. How many of them that do come home will come home to a job that has health insurance? Ask yourself Isaiah's question, how long will they fight for us if we don't let them be part of our nation? I submit to you the cost of doing nothing is really, really high. And I would submit to you the price control advocates are not going away. Seek is right, it won't work, but it is phenomenally appealing. And what I see if we do nothing is sometime in the not too distant future we will impose them and then we will be sorry we did nothing today. Thank you very much for your attention. What do you do, Rich? Why don't we take about 10 minutes for questions? We'll be running a little bit. We'll still be done at 3. Is that okay with the next panel there? Okay. Questions? If you get your mic up there, we're getting busy. Well, you know, I would honestly say, um, even though he's gone now, what, what Senator Vitale has proposed is just almost perfect. Because what he does is he puts down the marker. This is where we want to go. 
He does it in phases, in realistic ways, and he says, we're headed in this direction, but there's enough space in there for the feds to get their act together. Now, I will say to you, and this is not going to be a big shock, I hope, no one ever went broke betting against Washington solving a problem. So, you know, you don't want to say this is a high probability event. But I would say, go down that direction, wait and see, and then join Washington with, with the partnership. Think about Massachusetts. They've already out there on this limb. My personal bet is whatever happens in D.C., if it were indeed to become successful, they would grandfather in what the hell ever they want to have grandfathered in. So if you get ahead of Washington, you will be allowed to keep it. But more than likely, it would be smart to wait and see if you can get some federal lift on money. Because after all, I heard this rumor, it's hard to raise taxes at the local level. The people know where you live. Yes. Yeah, just, to, just to follow up on that, um, what about in terms of information systems and improving the information systems? It would seem to me that the state could put a lot of emphasis on trying to have the doctors and the hospitals yeah. and these information systems communicate with each other and make a plan within five years, we're going to have our state <coughs> infrastructure talking. Well, is that something that makes sense? You know, absolutely. If you look at Israel doing this in four years, I mean, good Lord. You know, you, you go to Washington, people say, oh, it'll take 20. Bullshit. It'll take will and, and maybe a requirement that if you want to get paid, you'll do this. And so, yes, you can do that. And that would be very helpful. And also, I would say set up an information repository so we can start doing monitoring of outcomes and actually feed the research to make life more efficient. Yes. In the back, yes. Um, well, you know, the auto uh, companies are sort of in a, in a uniquely extreme position because they actually spend twice as much on retiree health as they do for active health. You know, the auto companies are kind of like a European country whose birth rate is negative. I mean, fundamentally, they had a market share shrink and their whole business plan was based upon market share, either dominance or, or at least staying the same. So. They're frankly in the proverbial deep doo-doo. They, they, they have become a bad example of everything, and they almost hurt coalitions because they're seen as special pleading. They want help. At the same time, interestingly and somewhat paradoxically, they have become among the more astute buyers of health care because they have such a big problem. So they don't want to walk away from that expertise and, and that control, if you will, but they definitely want federal help. So they're kind of a special case. A more interesting case, I would submit, are kind of the, the, the Walmarts and the Costcos and the Kellys and the sort of the retail sector. Walmart is a company that has extremely large uh, everything, you know, but margins are actually small. So even for them, the long-term trajectories are ugly. And that's why they're emphasis on trying to come up with some kind of common ground is so catalytic. The Business Roundtable is a group of lobbyists that are interconnected and will never agree to do anything that doesn't serve every single member's interest, which means they will do nothing. The big associations are frankly the problem. You got to go straight to the CEOs, do the math with the CEOs of the individual companies, and get them to speak away from their lobbyists, then we have a chance. Maybe yes. one more question. Uh, um, I had a question about why do we hear a lot about Massachusetts now and the fail failures in California and other places. Whatever happened to some discussion of Hawaii's plan in the 70s that was pay or play and they've m made major changes in uh, providing care for more people and giving a basic package. Oregon, I think, had the same thing at one point. Minnesota also did something in the 70s. We don't hear about that. What's going on with those? Are those have those been as successful as they were originally? Well, um, let's take them one at a time. Oh, Hawaii was, as you say quite well, the first place to really try to achieve near universal. They had an employer mandate in mid 70s. In fact, it was the same time ERISA passed, if I recall. And they were sort of de facto given an exemption from all that. Um, but even Hawaii never got to Universal. They never got past 95, maybe 96. And over time, just like everywhere else, costs have, have begun to make that harder and harder. But don't forget, Hawaii is kind of surrounded by water. It's hard for companies to leave there, because how can you leave Hawaii? So fundamentally, um, 
they had a kind of a special deal. Minnesota, Washington State, Massachusetts all passed employer mandate type things which were then over time repealed, as Zeke said, basically because it's really hard to, to try to move a system when you can't uh, touch the companies that are big because they dominate your employment and your politics. And because, in my opinion, going forward, employer mandates, while they may be politically necessary in the short run for sort of minor things, that's not the smart way to finance our health care system over time because we have to stay competitive. So states can't do it without taxing employers, but that's non-starter, so they've got to turn to the federal government. Okay, thank you. Let's give Len a little clap for appreciation.